All right, good morning, everybody. It's, um, are we supposed to start at 45 exactly? Is, is that the, the norm? I don't really know. Okay, let's start on time. So this session is on um, version control, uh, specifically Git. That's really what's being used in, in Drupal. Um, the session really isn't specifically Drupal-based. It's more by, about the ideas of using version control, and these ideas translate quite well into Drupal. For the most part, Drupal does its own little thing with version control, but for the most part, these concepts will get you into version control. Um, when I first got into version control, it wasn't Git, it was something called subversion. Um, the ideas, I found that the learning curve and, and the entry point into Git version control very hard and confusing, uh, especially if you come from a background, uh, more as a front-end sort of person, and then you sort of like move into the development space, whereas really, you just expect it to know this stuff, and you have all this, these jargon of staging files and committing them and revision control and fast version control and source control and trunks and you go, what, the, what does all this stuff mean? And it's, it's very hard to, to get into an entry point. So um, I work for a, for a small business called Communica. I'm the developer there and um, you know we, we build sites in Drupal for the most part. There's a few other stuff we use. Um, I am I, I haven't had the honor to contribute to Core just yet, but I'm quite active in the uh, contributed space. Uh, a lot of patches. I'm the maintainer for a couple of modules up there. Uh, Commerce account to account, which is the main one, with a DPS payment gateway, even here in Oz, uh, quite large in New Zealand, and then an analytics firm in the UK. So version control doesn't need to scare you. It's actually quite a simple concept. All version co control does in its simplest terms, it tracks changes to files, specifically text-based files. So if you've, if you've ever used uh, revisions in Drupal or nodes, and you've turned on the diff module, and you click that little button, what's changed, and it shows you something like that, that's version control at a code level. Nothing more, nothing less. It's worth mentioning that version control only really works well in text-based documents, so stuff like PHP files, module files, CSS files, those kind of things. Even though you can stick binary-based files in there, like zip files or compressed files, image files, it'll track those changes, but it will track the file as a whole. It'll know that the file changed, but it doesn't know that all the red pixels were slightly shifted to a darker red shape. It'll just track the whole file. So, but on, on, a, on a layer of text files, it will track you know, text changes, pretty much what you see. The red got removed, the green got added. So when you're comparing Git to other larger um, version control solutions, probably the biggest one out there would be Subversion or SVN. They're essentially the same. Uh, Git works quite different to those. Those other service, those other version control system uses something like a centralized server. So for you to do anything significant, like you want to develop a new branch, and I'll explain what those things are a little bit later, but you've got a new feature that you're working on, you have to have a connection to that server to do it. Just like if you want to be a website on the internet, you need a connection to some kind of web host to make that work. So Git works different, it works local. So as soon as you make a copy of the vision control repository, which, which is the bit that tracks all the changes, uh, you have everything local, all the history forever. So if you like clone down Drupal from from um, Drupal.org, you get all the changes tracked from Drupal 4. And so it's insane how much data is there. So that, that's a, a good thing, a bad thing. You can clean that up over time. I mean, if you take like the span of Drupal, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of commits. So that transparency is really a good thing because you can see how stuff changed. It's not particularly useful to have Drupal 4 in there, admittedly, especially since we had 7, but when bugs are discovered, you can quite easily see how that came to be. So because everything is local and you don't need a connection to any kind of server, Git is insanely fast. To compare general tasks, um, like merging complex branches and features uh, to SVN, uh, when you first start using Git, if you've got experience, you think something went wrong. It couldn't possibly be this fast, but it is. Um, each, each feature branch that you create, or each copy that gets created from version control, is a backup in its own. So if you've got a production branch, which has got all your stable code, and you clone that into some new My Awesome feature that I'm working on, you get all the history from the other branch. So each branch surfaces, uh, serves as its own backup as well. 
So this is really unique to, to get. There are other systems that do this as well, but it's the idea of distributed version control. And so if I have a copy, it's like I mentioned just before in the previous slide, really, if I have a copy, I have all the history for that project. If you have a copy, you have all the history of that project. So the entire version control repository is distributed throughout all its users. And that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, because it means that you've got great concurrency. You can have many people working in their own type of workflows on their own kind of computers until they're ready and say, yep, this bit of stuff that I work on is now ready to contribute back, and so you can do that. So it's incredibly flexible from the workflow perspective because it's got its own distributed nature. These sort of th this distributed nature is simply not possible in SVN. Like if you're on the plane, flying somewhere, you've got a 10-hour flight, and you go, well, I've got some time to kill. Hey, I'll work on this, this bug, because you haven't got access to, like, SVN centralized server. There's nothing you can do. You can sort of, like, do your changes and then copy those changes to another file, and eventually, when you connect up, you can do some kind of manual thing to kind of fix it up. But in, in Git, it's just simple tasking. It's just dead simple. So branching is the idea of, of that any development track can have branches that spawn off it. So if you, if you think of a, of a tree, and this is actually how uh, Git documentation explains this themselves, is that you've got the tree trunk, which is the stable branch, and then you have these branches that shoot out from the trunk that describe uh, a development track, or it could be a feature track, or a bug fix track, or any kinds of those. And even off those tracks, you can branch off them. So you've got quite a bit of, of flexibility when it comes to branching. And because how Git handles its branching, it's cheap. It's quite easy to go and Drupal and say, oh, well, I want to try this idea I have in CSS that you don't know if it's going to work. So you just create a branch. You try those ideas out. And if it works, you just merge it back into the development track, and you're done. It's, 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 it's a very simple and easy task to do. So workflows. Um, this is where things start getting a little bit interesting in terms of the options that you have. Pretty much it means that with Git you can do any kind of crazy workflow. You can have a dead simple workflow where if you're a developer by yourself that you just have one development track, one, one branch that you work on and you just do commits against that branch and that's it, you're done. You can move on some Bigger spaces, if you like, start working on larger projects that has a testing team or security team or one of those kind of things, or, or have some more, more critical business needs where, you know, these are business critical functions, then maybe you've got some, some requirement where you've got a junior developer that creates a feature branch because they're working on some kind of, some kind of feature that needs to be implemented, and they merge that up to the development track where maybe there's some kind of peer review system and so another developer can check over the work and if that's happy they can move that into, um, and this slide is called the release branch, but it's quite often called the testing branch, where they can have a test team go and review those changes and then it can eventually move up into the green area which is master. So master is just, Drupal, um, not Drupal, I mean Git's default naming convention for what's considered the production branch. And so you'll see that a lot. You, you can change these branch names. It's, it's, you just go sort of like rename branch and there you go. You can call it live or production or stage or whatever, whatever you like. And you can also apply tags to uh, the different release points that you have. So you can see you've got um, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. And this is essentially how Drupal does this as well. This, this is the point releases that you get. Uh, on Drupal.org when you get you know, 7.3 or 7.33. Those are just something called get tags, and it's a particular point in time where a commit is that got tagged as, as a stable release. So the, the thing that makes Git a little bit unique is the idea of staging stuff. And truth be told, I've never really understand why they called it staging, because it, it really doesn't make any sense to the idea that before you can contribute a change to version control, you have to stage the change. And really, I think a better description is it's a pre-commit area. So if you change the file, you first have to change it as ready to be committed. So it's like saying, here's some changes I would like to make a snapshot of to go into version control. So that will become clear when I go through the file process. But it's like 
um, if I draw an analogy to your general desktop working environment, you have a file and you delete it. The file's not deleted, it gets put in your trash can until you clear your trash can. That is essentially what it is. You have a file that you're putting somewhere and say, hey, I would like to potentially commit this. And of course it's open source, right? And we all like open source. I mean, most of our stuff that we use in Drupal is open source. The operating systems are open source. The databases are open source. So that's really a good thing. So the inner workings. Um, I'm not going to get too geeky about this because it's an introduction and we won't get too technical. But essentially when you add a file to version control and get, you're creating an index file that says this is the state of the file right now and this is everything that's in that file. From that point on into the future, the only thing you keep track of is changes to that file. So if you change one line of CSS, the entire file doesn't get committed to version control again. It's just like line number 18 change and it is now this. And when you make another commit against that same file, that same file it says line number 28 change, and it's now this. And because of this idea of having this linear pattern, every change that you have is based on the previous commit that happened. And so since every change is also checksummed and hashed, you're never ever gonna have a, co a corrupt file. It simply doesn't exist. So it's incredibly secure from that perspective. If someone goes and fiddles in there, the entire repository would go, something is not right. And so that's quite useful. If you look at some uh, vulnerabilities last year, Drupal Geddon that came out, if you had your entire Drupal code base in, in version control, it would have been a simple command and you would have instantly seen what someone had changed in the file system and it would have been a simple task to roll back. Um, it's also worth mentioning at this point that Git does not track changes to the database. And so this is where the, where the big push is in Drupal 8 to try and move all that stuff into configuration management. Because like views are stored in the database, content types are stored in the base, everything's in the database. And it's very difficult to version control data. Because if you export the entire database from Drupal, it's this massive file. And you can add it to version control all you want. It's text-based, so that's fine. That's not an issue. But then when you do the new dump six months later, you know, you've got all the content tables in there and the way it relates, it just doesn't work. So version control database, short answer is forget about it. It's not going to happen anytime soon. There are some workarounds that you can can do and at the end of the, the presentation I've got some some resource you can look at where someone has worked on this a lot, but it's not an, an amazing solution. And this is where uh, the features module for Drupal 7 certainly comes into place because uh, you can take a lot of this configuration, views, content types and sort of like export it into some kind of, of manageable code version of what your Drupal site is like. So when you initially initiate a, a empty repository in a project, what happens in the in sort of like behind the scenes that you can't see, there's this folder that shows up. You can't see this folder. It's hidden unless you've got show hidden files turned on. Uh, it's called .git and everything lives in there. So if you ever wanted to delete the repository for whatever reason on your local machine, you just delete that folder and it's gone. And inside that folder there's a whole bunch of configuration stuff and for each commit that it makes, it creates an object with a hash value that's checksummed like I mentioned before. So Git only has three states, and those states refer to the state in which a file can be. I know there's four on there, but the one is in, in dashed lines for a reason. So you've got your working directory. This is quite commonly called or referred to as the working tree. This is where all your files are. This is typically Drupal root, if that's what you're version controlling. Everything that goes in that folder and its children gets version controlled, unless you add an ignore file, which makes, which makes sense. An example of why you'd want to ignore something like the files folder in Drupal, you don't version control that because that's user content and it's, it's not really version control's job to know about that. Version control cares about the code base. So you, you, know, you version control your themes, your modules, your custom modules, uh, libraries, things like that that you add to the project. 
a bit of argument can go into that. It's sort of like what works for you. Some developers see version control of the entire Drupal and Drupal core and all the contributed modules. Other developers will say, why version control that's already, why version control something that's already version controlled? I mean, all the modules in Drupal, they're all already under version control, so do you really have to revision control that? I think it's a choice for your own workflow. Uh, for us at Communica, we use multi-sites for even a single site install. So we don't version control anything but what we know is, is different. So we only version control custom modules, custom libraries, and custom themes, nothing else. Uh, I don't care about, as far as I'm concerned, views is version controlled already. I don't need to revision control that again. So in your working tree, you'll have your files. And so when you change a file, it will show up in the working tree. And you'll see that soon in the next few slides that come up. So once you're ready and you're ready to make a change, you're ready to, to record that change into the Git repository, you move that file into the staging area. Like I said, this is your pre-commit area. You're saying, is, hey, here's a change that I would like to record. Once it's in the staging area, you can then contribute that or commit that, that change into the history. And, and that is just a log file. That's all it is. Once you've done that, your working, retrieve, your working tree returns back to blank. Not as in blank as in there's no files, as in blank there's no changes to those files anymore. So as soon as you edit a file again, the working tree will show that, hey, here's a file that's changed. And then you change that file and you go, okay, I'm happy. I want to now commit that. You stage the file and then you commit it and then it returns back. So in the far left, you've got this um, stashing thing. So the way Git works is as soon as you try and pull changes from a developer, let's say you've got a colleague working on the same project, and the colleague says, hey, I fixed this bug, and you go, I would like to have that bug fix in, in my code base too. And you go, I want to pull those changes into my working tree, Git is going to tell you, no, you can't do that. Because Git's going to go, you have changes to your files, and he has changes to his file. I don't know how to merge those things together. So the, the solution to that is, one, you can create your own branch where you can commit those changes to and then bring it back into the working tree at the end or you can simply like do a stash and that's just like temporary save these changes outside of version control so I can bring them back in later. It's not something you use a lot but it can come up. So if you look at the, the life cycle of a file for an individual file, for an individual workflow, the process is always the same. It doesn't ever change. First, the file gets created. Even when you go new file and Sublime or PHP Storm or whatever it's you're using, you're creating a blank file. Then the next stage, change, the next stage is to change that file in some way. And that could be, I'm adding code to that file. It could even be, um, if it's some PHP stuff, maybe you want to change the permissions and who can execute commands on that file. Any kind of state change to that file, Git will pick that up. So you change the file. Then you have to add the file, and that git add is literally the command you'll fire. So you'll git add to the staging area, and then you'll commit that change. And then it's in version control. So at this point, you're working in a tree, your working tree returns back to blank. There's no more changes. And then the process just starts again. And that happens for every single file in your project. Change a file, you add it, you commit it. Change a file, add it, commit it. And that does not change ever. So if you blow this up to a team, because so often, so often we work by ourselves, lots of times we have a team of people. So we've got a persona or a person here, John, which has exactly the same flow. Creates a file, changes it, adds it, commits it, until, some po until, until such point that John goes, okay, I'm happy to now contribute that to the rest of the team. So at that point, he fires the git push command, which pushes his changes into a, into a hosted repository. This could be Git bucket, uh, Bitbucket, it could be GitHub, it could be Drupal.org, it could be GitLab. There's plenty of solutions out there that offer us hosted service. You can even run your own hosted service if you want to do some projects like GitOlite or GitOsys will, can do that for you. But you have to install that in the server and it sort of like becomes an admin thing. Some businesses find that important, that they say, hey, we don't want to share our code in any kind of hosted service for security reasons, especially if you start working like on banking stuff and like, you know, serious financial stuff, then they, they can get a bit of iffy about that. So suffice it to say, you push that up to some kind of shared 
said centralized place. This is not to be confused with the same as a centralized server like version control because each version of your repository is distributed. So what John has is an exact copy of what's in the hosted server. And so you could technically log into the hosted server and do whatever you like there and it's its own unique copy until that changed as pulled downstream somewhere. This is something you'll hear um, or read up a lot about uh, push this upstream, push that downstream. And all that means is push something up towards someone or pull something down towards yourself. So upstream is away from you. So if you push it up to a hosted server that's upstream, and if you do a pull, you're pulling it downstream. So then Jane comes along, and she wants to work on the, on the same code base as John did. Maybe it is a new feature. Maybe it's, it's just collaborative. And so what she has to do is she first has to clone it. And cloning is... is Virtually the same as going to Drupal.org and downloading the zip file. The difference is with Drupal.org, when you download the zip file, they don't include the version control references, so you don't get that with. But if you fire the appropriate uh, git clone, Drupal.org, whatever the URL is, then it will pull on all those references. So for, in order for Jane to realistically contribute to the project, she has to clone the git repository. So she clones it down, and then she has exactly the same process as John. She changes the file, she adds it, and she commits it. And she does that process until it reaches a state where she's happy. And she can do that process in any kind of way that she likes. She might choose to create another branch and do those changes in another branch until she feels she's reached some kind of stable state that she wants to contribute that back. Even if she did that on another branch and she pushed back, let's assume she did that changes on, on a bug fix branch and she decided to push that bug fix branch up and John didn't have that. As soon as John pulled the changes, he'll automatically get that branch. But it, it, just, it just works. It's just there. So Jane, in this case, will go, OK, I'm done with my feature. I'm going to push it back. I'm going to contribute this back. So she pushes the changes upstream to the hosted repository. And now John has the ability to bring those changes into his. Because the moment he tries and does a push, the server is going to say, hey, look, something changed on the server that I don't know about. Please commit your changes that you have right now. If, if, if John hadn't done that, and do a pull. So in this case, he's going to do a, a fetch and then do a merge. And so that's quite commonly um, referred to as pull, and there's an actual git command that's called git pull, which is the one you'll probably use, but it's just firing those two commands for you in concurrency for you. So it'll first do a fetch, and then it'll do a pull for you automatically. And so, so if John makes a whole bunch more changes and tries to push it up, yep. you can't. Yep. Yep. Correct. That's right. Because version control doesn't know how to run that task on the server. Right? It's it's not it's not the server's job to know how to how to merge those changes. For all that we know, uh, Jane and John edited exactly the same file, and most likely they did, and even worse, they might have edited exactly the same line numbers. So it'll then be up to John to take those changes from Jane, which is on the hosted server, and go, these are how I resolve these conflicts. And it sounds incredibly complicated. It, it's not, really. It's just going to tell you, hey, that the things don't match up. Please do a pull. So you do a pull, and then it's going to say, either it's going to work successfully, which is what happens 90% of the time, and then sometimes it'll go, look, there's some conflict. And then you have to go in and, and resolve that conflict. And it's not incredibly difficult to do it. It quite marks it out in, in the code. I don't have an example of it here. If there's time, I'm more than happy to show that. Uh, but I will show that, hey, this is what it's before. This is what it's now. I don't know how to merge that. And quite often, it's not like, like it'll be like 100 lines of code. It's like five or six. And it's just like, you usually just go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I'll just move this over here, move that over there, and, and then you're done. Yeah, so get fetch sounds, it's a little bit confusing. It's not get fetch. It says go to the hosted repository, and this up there on the little round dot, and it says fetch the changes and tell me what those changes are. Don't do anything with the changes. Just tell me if they are changes. Okay. Is that same as similar to what you status? Completely. Get status show you the current status of a repository where get fetch is... It says download the references that's changed in the repository. And so we... What's the difference between get, uh, get fetch and get pull? Okay, so get pull will attempt to fetch the changes 
Remember, it's not fe it's it's just fetching. It's just saying is what is different on your copy than mine. It doesn't do anything with that information. It just says, tell me what's different. Do you have some commits that I don't know about? And if you do, then you can act on that. Where get pull will do a fetch that'll so go to the server and say, fetch the changes. Tell me what they are, and then try and take those changes and merge it into my <coughs> into my working tree. So. Get pull is just a shorthand for doing good fetch and then get merge manually. So Jane can't do good fetch and merge up and get the first. Yeah, well get clone is just the process of getting the repository on a computer. If she's done if she's done the first but she's done a get clone, she can instantly do a get fetch. Right there and then. Good. Right now she can. Yeah, yeah, she has to first clone it. To, to get it, and then she can do a fetch. And so because John gets that bit to fetch the changes and merge it, so does Jane. And so that process just continues. And so whether there's two people working it, or 100 or 1,000, the process is the same. It doesn't change at all. So when, the, when we blow this up to the flow of how a project works, um, like I mentioned earlier on, it gets very flexible with your workflow. And um, I'm going to show three examples here. These are the three common ones out there. This is typically what you have in a very, very small web shop or a, just a developer by himself. And, you know, we throw this term out there, developers. This is for themers. This is for anyone who makes any kind of text-based change. Okay, it's not just for, for developers who are hardcore people. Um, so... In this case, the person has a development track, which is the main branch that they're working on and, and rolling out new, new, new features or scope or whatever they get asked to do. And then the person might have a crazy idea and say, hey, I heard about this new awesome CSS compiler called LibSAS, and I'm going to change my grid system to something else. And so they'll go and try it out. They don't know if that idea is going to work out. They're sort of like in a prototyping discovery phase and go, is this going to work? So a good way to do that is to create a separate branch and try that out. Because there's actually an arrow missing there. As soon as the person wants to create another branch, they'll create it from an existing branch. So when you're working, you always have one checked out branch, which is what you're working on. That could be your master branch, which is production, or it could be your development. If the person is developing, it's most likely the development branch, which means at the point that they create a new branch, they create a branch with all the history from the branch that they're creating it on. So if I go get branch create, and I've got development checked out, I get all of development's copy into my feature branch. Or if I was in the production branch, I'd get all the code that's in the production branch into my feature copy. No, it's required. Yeah, if there's a way to create a blank one, I have not seen it. <laughs> because the whole idea is for, for, for this to work, when you try and merge these changes up, let's say this, this feature worked out, in this case it did, because that change then gets merged back into the development track. So whatever the developer did here worked. It was, it was a great idea. Sometimes it was a crap idea, and you just delete it, and <laughs> say, so that never happened. So in this case, you get merged into the development branch, and at some point, it gets merged back up, to, up into production. And so all those branches know about these changes. You can see the feature branch got deleted. Because it got merged into the main development cycle, there's no longer any need to have that branch there. You have to do this manually. You have to go and delete branch. You could leave it there, but eventually you end up having a lot of branches. And then as, as people, we're usually quite crap at naming things, and you call it feature one, <laughs> something like that. And so six months down the track, you go, what did this mean again? So uh, you typically delete it just, just to keep yourself a little bit sane. So if you work in a bigger organization, that's probably the kind of flow that you'll have. This is officially known as the Git flow um, process. Uh, I don't personally use it myself. I don't find it all that flexible, but it is very, very well documented and is used by a lot of shops. Um, so the idea is that you have your main development track at which bug fixes and whatever happens, happens, right? It's just do this, do that. And then you'll get another person on board and they'll work on a feature that could be considered unstable or it's just a new feature. And so that person or that developer will work on that feature branch until such stage 
that they feel it's reached, it reached the stage where they can contribute that to the development branch. At that point, they merge it up into the development branch, and since they're happy with it, they can either choose to delete the branch, which they probably will do in this workflow, or they can choose to keep it. And then right at that same point, a testing branch gets created. Now, they quite often refer to this as a release branch as well. And so from the testing branch, they'll, they'll get an independent tester or they have a test team or, or you know, maybe it's just a project manager that does a bit of user testing or whatever. Let's say they kind of find some kind of issue. So the fix will then be applied on the testing branch because if you look at the, how the commit dots has worked, the, the, the feature branch no longer exists because it was considered stable and it moved into, a develop, into the development cycle. So they fix the change on the testing branch and... That's why there's a second dot. So there was another commit. Maybe it would have gone straight up to, to, the, um, to the master branch. It didn't, doesn't need to be a second commit there. It's just in this example there is. So the idea with Git Flow is the moment it's moved to the testing branch, all the changes happen on the testing branch and nowhere else because you're, you're now in a state of, well, the code is semi-stable, but we found a small issue and we need to deal with that. So it always happens on that. Once that has reached a sign-off point by whomever the, the official is that makes that kind of decision, it gets moved up into the production branch, and it now lives in the production branch. At the same time, it gets merged down to the development branch again. Because if you look at how that's worked, clearly, if it didn't move down to the development branch, there would be a commit in the system that development branch doesn't know about. So it has to move down. Once that happens, the testing branch gets deleted. If another bug is found, uh, depending on how critical the bug is, there will either be another branch created to resolve that issue or some other kind of workflow will happen. But of course, you know, as, as, as developers or, or as the, the, the principle of that all software is broken is sometimes we screw up and we have mistakes. So sometimes with this kind of process, which is typically and mid to enterprise level, level businesses that use it, is that the process of getting anything deployed into production is usually too long because you have your development cycle and then you know, some peer review system usually and then a testing cycle. And so if there's some critical bug and it needs to be fixed right now, we need to account for that or we need to account for that. And so a great example would that be was with the Drupal Geddon hack. So I don't know if anyone was familiar with that, but that was... A, pretty decent one, right? So you don't have the time luxury to deal with a whole development cycle to fix that. So you need to allow a way to deal with that. So what would happen is this would typically happen directly on the server because these are business critical issues that, are, that you would have to deal with. So you create something called a hot fix branch. You'll do this directly on the server. You'll, take, you'll clone that directly from the production branch because that's your stable code base that you know and trust and you do your fix. So in the example of Drupal Geddon, you replace the database.inc file, which is where the vulnerability was. The moment you've done that, you merge it back straight into production again. So now your Drupal core or, or your, your production version of that site is stable again, and you merge that same information down to your development track so that the development, development track has that change too. Is that an automated process? Or do you have to push it to both? You have to do it manually. So if, if you've got continuous integration set up, you can do that. Obviously not the bug fix thing because it wouldn't know about it. And so, but if you've got full continuous integration set up, you can, you can solve even that bit with continuous integration. But doing continuous integration is really, really hard and takes a long time to do very well. So you'll find that most places just do this manually and go get push, log into the server, get pull, get merge, or whatever the, the commands are that they need to fire. What do you mean by that? Okay, so, so checkout doesn't mean, um, checkout means return my code to a stable state. So if you had a file that you changed and you go get checkout index.php, what it will do, it will revert whatever changes you made to the index.php to whatever version control knows that it should be. Does that make sense? So, so checkout is not, it, it's not about, uh, well, I guess it is it's in, in the sense that you're saying is return my code to a stable state. So uh, the commands that's fired to revert changes or checkout changes is literally get checkout, get revert, and get reset. Those are the three you need to do. And I, I'll talk a bit about them a little bit later. 
so this is the process we actually use. And this is not that dissimilar from, from the Git flow previous example, but it, I guess it abstracts out the idea of independent deployability a little bit better. So, you know, you scope out a job or you have an existing job and the client come back, they never come back and say, we want this one little change, right? There's always like 10 things. And so you're going as well, gosh, these 10 things is 100 hours worth of work. And so you go, well, how do I independently deploy each feature on its own? So, because one of the tasks might be five hours worth of work and one of mine might be 30 hours worth of work. You're obviously not going to finish them at the same time. So the idea is that you clone directly down from, from the green dots, from the master branch. And the only reason I didn't include the arrows in there is because it would have made the, made the graph insane. So you clone down from, not clone down, that's the wrong term, you create a new branch from the development track, from the, sorry, the production branch, the master branch, and then you make the changes to the branch that you're working on. So in this case, we're working on a feature called related content, and so you make all the changes that's relevant to related content on the related content branch, and only that branch. If you muck up, there are some things you can do to resolve it, but it's really painful. It just my suggestion would be is just be disciplined enough not to do that because it's difficult to fix. You might also have another developer working on the geofencing thing, which is a much bigger job to do. So that developer is working on that branch and that branch only. And they, you know, your, your front end people might be working uh, on the infinite IE bug or you know, someone might be working on some other bug. And so the idea is at any point, once, it, once one of these features reach a stable state, you can merge that into stage. So stage copy is typically the copy you show your client to get sign off on, or for us it is anyway. So the client usually gets access and you go, hey, we've deployed this awesome geofencing functionality, go give it a test. And the client comes back, that's amazing. And that means we can deploy just that change to production without having completed related content, the IE bug, or the, um, the other one, the notice, the notice error. So it gives us independent deployability, which is very, very helpful. I mean, we've all had that and go, well, we can't really push this up because too much code changed. We have to do it in one big chunk, and it just makes the project lag on. So it's really cool to independently deploy these things if you can. So Git is unfortunately a command line tool. Um, at some point, the reality is, is you're going to have to suck it up and learn it. Um, GUIs can take you a long way, and in fact, my, my workflow is about 50-50 split about using a GUI. I am not a die-hard person that says, no, command line. I can do all the commands in uh, command line. And if you don't have something like continuous integration set up, the reality is at some point, you're going to have to shell command into your server and run one of these commands in order to get it. And at some point, something is not going to work, and you're going to have to fix something. So. You're going to have to learn it at some point. That said, from a, from a GUI perspective, there are some great applications out there. Uh, there's not enough time in this talk to go through them, but some of the big ones out there is uh, GitHub desktop version. There, there's one you can download directly from GitHub. There's uh, one from Atlassian uh, called Sourcetree. That's pretty good. Tower is amazing. Um, I don't know who makes that. However, if you get Tower, I urge you to get version 1. Version 2 sucks. Um, and it's just really cool, right? It takes this idea of creating another branch really easy. It's drag and drop. You take the branch, you drag it up, and it says, hey, would you like to create a new branch? You go, boy, yes, I do. And it's done. And you make your changes, you commit it, and then you go, hey, I want to merge this. And you just drag and drop the branches on top of each other, and it goes, hey, would you like to merge this? And you go, well, yes, I do. And if, it's, if there's a, a conflict, it'll put a nice big red dot there and say, there's an issue in this file. So you can open that file and fix it. And so I find those things really useful. Where from the command line perspective, those things are a little bit harder to deal with, but still very possible. Sorry, what was the second one you said? Tower. 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 It's a Mac-only app, so if you're on Windows, no luck. Sorry. Yep. Uh, there's some other ones. There's Gitbox. Uh, that's quite popular. There's SmartGit. Or is it SmartGit? I think it's called SmartGit. I don't like that one because they've decided that they'll change the terminology of Git, so it's difficult to relate that information into... Um, into command line when you have to do it, and you go, what the hell does this mean? So I'm not a big fan of that. The, the best one I've used so far is definitely Tower, but I hate Tower too, which is the one they're currently selling, so I don't know if you can still purchase version one. Uh, Source Tree is not bad either. I've not really significantly used the uh, GitHub one. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
um, if there's time, come see me because we're running pretty tight in time. So um, I'll, I can show that if everyone wants to stay a little bit. There's no, no, no issue there. So the process of, of doing that, this is actually a real live example of, of the process that you do. So I've got some kind of project. It's just some pseudocode that I wrote. And so the first thing you'd have to do is you first have to initialize an empty repository. And so that's literally the command. Um, it's the get init command. So I'll just go back one slide because I didn't explain this. If you look at the top, the get syntax is always the get keyword followed by a sub command. It's the same for every single command. Those are the main ones you're going to use. Init, add, commit, log, status, so on and so forth. Those are the main, the main ones. And then quite often you can pass additional flags. It's like additional little operators to the command. For example, if you do get log, you might not want to see the entire log. You might only want to show a short little log message, then what you can do is you can strip out a lot of that content by passing additional flags to the command. So the first thing you'll do is you'll do a git init, which initializes an empty repository. That just says, hey, I want to track the stuff in this folder and all its children. And it, it's, it's at this point that it creates that hidden folder that I talked about, the .git folder. Then the next bit, I'll show you here is the get status command. And so that just says, hey, show me what's happening in my working tree. Has any files changed? And so in this case, Git's quite good at giving you little hints about what needs to do. It says on there, uh, if you see the little bit in purple, which is not all that readable, it's going to say, hey, right below that, here are some untracked files. And you're probably going to use the get add command next because you've already edited the file. You're at the point where you say, hey, I want to contribute something back to my repository. So next you're probably going to fire the get add command. It also shows you the files. If you've got get um, colors turned on a command line, it will show you the, the files in red, which is untracked at the moment. So the next bit is just to add it to the staging area, like I mentioned before. You're going to get to this little pre-commit area. So you're going to fire the get add command, which just says, hey, I'm going to add it to the staging area. Um, so there are a few little different ways you can do it. You can do git add dot. So the dot in command line just means my current location. So in that case, it says git add everything where I'm at right now. So if there's one file or 500 or 5,000 files, this is going to add the lot to your git repository. You can also pass some additional parameters in it. This is most likely what you'll do. Uh, you'll probably go git add the file name that you want or the folder that you want to add if you don't want to add everything. Um, you can go a bit crazy and you can throw some wildcard characters on these. So you can go git add star.css, which will only add the CSS files to the git repository. So um, here I fired the um, git add dot because this is the very first time I'm adding content into the repository because it's just still an empty repository until I commit it. So it would make sense to add absolutely everything the first time. This is very common. So you'll do git add, and if you then do a git status, what you're going to see is that your file status are now to be committed. So it changes to be committed down the bottom, and it will typically show it in a different color for you and list all the files. It will only list like the folder level. It won't literally go into the includes file and show all those for you, but they're there. Where's you getting the files from? From the working tree. So everything that's in the same level of where get gets installed, it will try and do track all those files, the whole lot. Unless you tell it not to, which you will do in Drupal. For example, on Drupal, you would exclude the files folder. Like I say, that, that's content managed areas. You don't want to track all the pictures that people upload. It, it doesn't, wouldn't make sense to do that. So that gets excluded. Uh, quite often, you would uh, exclude your, like your settings.php file in Drupal. That's not something you really want to stick out on version control and say, hey, here's my username and password, especially if you're sticking that on a public hosted service like GitHub and you don't have a private repository. Probably not something you want to advertise out in the world. So usually, Drupal 7 is pretty good with including some reasonable defaults for ignoring files. It will automatically ignore the settings.php uh, file for you in the files folder. Um, but it's quite reasonable that you might want to add a little bit more. In our own workflow, we add a local.settings file, which is something we change dynamically based on the environment that it runs on. So in our local development environment, for example, in our settings file, we'll turn on all error reporting. We're in our production environment. We'll make sure that that, that that flag is set to false so that we don't manually have to go into Drupal for every production site and go turn error reporting off. You can just simply turn that on in configuration files in Drupal. So the next bit is to um, record the change to version control. So we've now created a file, we've added those files, 
we, we stage them, the whole bit, so the next bit is to record those changes into the history. So we do that with the git commit command. I'm passing a flag there, hyphen m, just to make, to make the, the process a, bit, a little bit shorter. If you don't, it's going to open up another little window where you can be a lot more descriptive about your message. Um, I always use a sort hand because I feel personally that commit messages should directly relate to what you did, and so usually the short message is enough to explain what you did. I'm not a huge fan of having big massive commits, but your first commit will always be huge because you're adding all your files to the git index. So very often you'll see the first commit is called first commit or initial commit or initialize git or something like that because you're not really interested in what changed, you're just really establishing that you're adding stuff to version control and it's only after that point that you care about change. It's going to do a whole bunch of stuff there, it's going to tell you how many files you're adding to uh, version control, obviously in the case of Drupal it would be fairly a few more than two, um, how many insertions there was, and a whole bunch of stuff. The only thing really worth mentioning, it will always tell, tell you what branch you've made the commit on, in this case master, and it'll give you this hash number, and that's the short hash, and that is a unique identifier for that commit, and you'll get one of those for each commit. You don't really need to know it unless you want to look in what happened at a commit, at which point you need the hash. But uh, you just do like git log and it will show you all the hashes and you then go and show the hash, or show the, show the changes against that hash. So after we've committed it, if you do the git log command, it will show you exactly what it is. You see the full commit hash, which is, I forget how many characters, many, and that's a 250, uh, it's, a, it's a SHA-1 hash for anyone who cares, and it's checksummed. And so it'll show who the committer is and what date it happened. And this is a great way, I don't want to say to assign blame, but if something happened in a project at some point, there's another command you can fire, git blame, it's literally called git blame, and you can see who edited what line of code when. And so sometimes when, it's when you know, you're working with someone, you go, oh, I didn't change that for you, go, oh, we'll just check about that. Right, so now you go into this whole process of editing your files, right? You want to, you, you know, you write more CSS, you add TPL files, you do whatever you need to do in the project. So I've edited my files, if I now fire the get status command, you'll see that no longer does it say new files to be added, it now says, hey, these are files that change, these are modified files. And so it'll again give you a little hint there, you probably want to use get add to add this to the staging area once you're happy. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm just going to add the first one because I only really want to commit the index file changes here. So I'll go git add index.php. And if you then fire a git status, you'll now see that you've got two states of files. You have one that's to be staged, or one, sorry, one that is staged and one that's still just known as modified but it's not staged. When you get a little bit more advanced, you can have the index file in both states. So you can, you can say I only want to commit this section of what was changed, but that's, that's that gets a little bit further on, but it is possible. So I'll then commit that change, and if you do a git status then, you'll see that the working tree from what I've just committed has returned back to blank, except for, what, for my unstaged file, because git doesn't know what to do with that until I tell it to do that. Finally, if you do a git log, you'll now see you've got two log messages uh, both describing those things, and obviously they're both made by me. So it can be quite useful when you want to see, well, what did I actually change in this file, right? You, I mean, you add, you add spaces and maybe you indent stuff more. So if you fire the git, um, the git diff command, which is what I did over here, this happens on, on one line. I just made it two columns for readability's sake because I couldn't fit it. Uh, it'll show you what changed. And anyone has ever downloaded a patch of Drupal.org, that's exactly what it looks like. In fact, that is exactly the command you'll fire. You'll just read it into a text file. That is a patch file right there and then. It says, hey, when you want to run this, um, that's exactly what's going to change. The bits in blue there, the at at sign, refers to the line numbers that changed. Like I said, git only tracks what's changed. It doesn't care about the rest of the file. It only gets added once, and then it just tracks the changes. So we know that from those lines and exactly how they relate to the line numbers can be a little bit confusing, but that's what it means. Those are the line numbers that changed. And then any of the little minus bits in red is what got removed from the file, and the bits in green is what got added to the file. Then you can use the git show command to show what's changed at any given commit. So since, um, you know, you, you might have a commit that's, that's three weeks old, and you want to go, damn, what did I change again? I can't remember. You can use the git show command, and you can pass the hash to it. You don't have to pass the entire full hash, which, which is... A lot of characters, like usually five or six is enough, 
and it will return that resolve for you. And that's exactly it. Again, it's the same syntax as get diff in terms of what it's showing, what got removed, what got added. So a few more commands is get reset. So if you've done some crazy thing and you just want to revert the entire change that you've made, um, you can do get reset head. And that head keyword is written just like that in uppercase in version control. And that just refers to the current active branch that you're on. So if I'm working on a feature branch and I go get reset head, it means get reset the feature branch I'm on. If I'm on master branch, it will refer to the master branch. And so it's just a, an easy way to, to call the branch that you're on. Otherwise, you, you explicitly have to say, this is the branch I want to run this command on. And if you've got 10 or 15 of these things, that can become a little bit painful. Get push pushes any changes upstream to a hosted server somewhere. Uh, GitHub, GitBucket, one of those things. Get fetch, we already talked about. That literally just downloads the object references that changed from the repository. It doesn't do anything with that information. Get merge takes those history, that changes that's come in, and merges it into your current working tree. Get pull, just do those two things together for you, so that's probably the one you're going to use. And then finally, there's some really good resources there. Obviously, it's a bit of a boring read, really, uh, is Git's direct documentation. I find Bitbucket's documentation amazing. That's a great place to go to. Um, Wikipedia has some, has some good information on it as well. Uh, I really like learning by video content. So there's one um, from NetHuts. It is a paid service, but it's not all that expensive. That will... Uh, show a lot of demos of these commands um, and, and how they work and how to resolve conflicts and those kind of things. And then there's there's an absolute great series by Chris Satic from Build the Module, which is a Drupal specialist, and he specifically talk about version controlling Drupal changes. And he all goes through a lot of stuff like features and what can you do to try and do some changes in the database and try and version control that and some good practices and how to go about version controlling Drupal specifically. Are there any questions? Sorry, maybe my, my earlier question was, at this point, uh, do you need to create branches? Will you be creating branches? I create, I create a branch for every task that I have. So if I have a task that says um, build a new view in Drupal, I'll create a branch for that. Because I'll most likely take that view and export it into features. I'll commit that features to version control and then I'll merge it into the staging branch. I'll get sign off from the client from that staging branch. So if we go... And from staging, do you push it? Never ever, not on my workflow. This, this is my own preferred workflow. This is not an established standard. I will never ever, 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 ever merge stage upstream, ever. It will never ever happen. That's why you don't see an arrow going from stage to production because Developers can be lazy and they'll contribute something to in stage that's not been tested and hasn't got sign off. So for me, in our workflow, you have to push it from the staging. You have to push it from your feature branch. My staging branch is my client sign off branch. They're happy with the feature. We've tested our deployment. We know that it works. We'll move just that change up into production. Yep. What it does is it adds some code to your document, so it, it'll go, you're always on a particular branch where you're going to do a merge. So let's say you want to move changes into stage, so what you're going to do is you're going to switch to your stage branch, and you're going to fire a command, let's say we're committing that first change um, related content into it, so the command's going to be git merge feature forward slash related content. And so Git's going to come back, either it worked, or it's going to say, whoa, there's been an issue. And it's going to say the issue was, let's say it's on index.php. When you open that file up, there'll be a whole bunch of um, arrows and stuff that shows this is what it was, this is what it's going to be, and you can just manually resolve that. It, it's dead simple. It's, it's, it's quite clear. It, um, it looks scary as hell, but when you actually look at the lines of code, it, it's not a big deal. If you use something like Tower, you might know intrinsically that, hey, my new version that I've just committed is right. I don't care what's in the other version. It's really convenient. You can right-click and say resolve using my copy as opposed to the known copy. 
And so from that perspective, it's really good, but it's not always the case. I think these guys are going to kick me out. You guys will have to talk to me after. Yeah? There's a quick question about uh, Drush. Yeah. When I'm using Drush, sometimes it says it, it represents Gitter Bash because I don't actually have Git repositories on my stuff. How does Drush and Git work together, and is that seamless and automatic? I have no idea. I've never seen anything of Drush and Git work together. Oh, right. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yes. That's because um, y you can do updates to Drupal in two ways. You can do it by just replacing the module, which is typically what Drush does, or you can use version control to do it. It's a lot harder, so you can say, hey, no, 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 I'd run these updates by pulling the references from version control. But that really requires you to install Drupal in a very specific manner, rather than downloading the zip files or using Drush DL to download those files. You would specifically have to download the, the Git clone versions of those modules for that to work. 